morning. Good morning. All right. So I'm Scott Redd, and I'm the CEO and president of this great building that we call Sabathony. So on behalf of the staff, volunteers, and organizations and community members who share this space, welcome to Sabathony Community Center, the heart of South Minneapolis, where our mission is to provide people of all ages and cultures with the essential resources that inspire them to build a thriving community. And we could not do that without partnerships like we have with Second Harvest Heartland. We're pleased to host this conversation today, and as an agency partner of Second Harvest Heartland, we work to end hunger through our community food shelf. And as the heart of South Minneapolis, we're committed to confronting and eliminating racial disparities that for far too long have plagued this rich nation of ours. We are the heart of South Minneapolis, and you are the veins and the arteries that feed this great city of ours. So thank you for being here today, and please enjoy the conversation. And as a reminder, please, please turn off your cell phones and take part in this great conversation. Thank you very much. Take care and be well. And I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, Suk Jin. Thank you, Scott. Yep. Thank you so much. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. It's so great to see all of you. Before we kick off, once again, can we give a big round of applause to Scott and Sebastian? phenomenal community organization that's been doing such great work here supporting the South Minneapolis community and beyond. So great stuff, Sabathany. Um, I, as Scott mentioned, I am Suk Jin Ong. I'm here today as the host of this wonderful conversation. I am so excited to be here with all of you today um, to really lean into a conversation that really matter. I mean, you know, we all know why this work matters. We know why we have to challenge, you know, um, racial disparities and really do the hard work that it takes to move towards a more equitable future. And it's through conversations like this, I hope that inspires us and encourages us to lean further into doing this work in a way that's authentic, that's real, that's with community. And that's why I'm just so excited to be joined by these five amazing rock stars today. Um, so without further ado, um, Delinia, Diane, Stacy, Daisy, and Allison. Um, you all have this, I hope, um, and there's all the amazing things that you can learn about their work in this particular um, booklet uh, that you could look at as well. Um, the one thing that I do want to name too is um, a couple of housekeeping pieces and a special announcement before we um, jumped in. So um, some of you on your way in, you may have received like a no, ask for a note card if you have any questions. So like I know I have questions that I'm curious to ask the panelists. Um, and there's, if there's any time left at the end, um, we'll collect questions from the audience and ask them to um, the panelists as well. So kind of hang in there for that. Um, the other piece that I'll also mention is that um, I know I learn best when I take notes. That's why I have my little pencil here with me. But if you, you know, want to take notes for yourself, there's also a little section in the back of um, the program note card um, that helps you to kind of take in some of these notes. I think that's really key because more than just a good conversation, we want to move to action, right? So sometimes taking time to slow down, to reflect, to kind of soak in all the goodness from this conversation is really key for that. Um, so something to kind of keep in mind. Um, and also, um, I would love all of us to give Delinia a round of applause because it's her birthday today. And <laughs> Happy birthday. Happy birthday. It's just such a gift to have an amazing leader like Delinia here today. I mean, on her birthday, right? But that just shows how much this topic matters and means a lot um, to community leaders like Delinia, um, who's here today for her birthday. So, anyway. Um, so, I think without further ado, let's get to what you're here for. So, um, once again, thank you so much panelists for joining us here today for this conversation. Um, I know that, you know, in the past year, well, past years really, conversations around race and equity has come out a lot, especially in the sectors that, you know, we all work in, right? And so much of that is 
really encouraging, encouraging us to lean in and challenge ourselves to do this work better. Um, we've seen pledges being made. We have seen folks saying, I want to do better in this work. And yet, you know, sometimes I think we have to dig deeper than just some of these surface level conversations on what equity really is about. So um, just to kick us off, if you could introduce yourself to all of us, um, you know, a little bit about yourself and tell us why you care that we go beyond words and go into action when it comes to um, addressing the racial hunger divide. So we could start anywhere. I will just keep track of um, who's answered and make sure that all of y'all did. Okay, my name is Delinia Bears. Um, I think the important thing is for us to be the people we needed when we were younger and to show an example and make sure our children are able to have something to follow and have the equity that they deserve. Yeah, absolutely. I can keep us going here. Good morning, everyone. I'm Diane Tran. I use she, her pronouns, and I work at M Health Fairview. Uh, and we're a hospital healthcare system and an academic partnership with the University of Minnesota Medical School. Um, and I think just in this spirit of you know how we show up as individuals as well as these institutions or groups, um, I would just say my experience growing up as uh, someone who identifies as Chiu uh, you know, uh, ethnicity related to um, China, but also having parents who grew up in Vietnam and then being born here as the daughter of refugees, um, so much about place and where we are and what we have access to and how much we retain of the people from whom we come and can maintain and support that culture um, comes through food, right? And so personally, as I think about the ways in which myself um, and my family and others of us who want to feel um, connected to our own selves and advancing equity for all the identities that show up and that exist, um, and deserve to be seen and supported is really critical, <clears throat> excuse me, um, to, to the ways in which structures and systems like food and how it's grown and produced um, and then made available or accessible all need to be contended with. So I also really think about that personal and political connection when thinking about the ways in which we create welcome and access and inclusion or may not through our actions and the systems we create and support. So glad to be here for today's conversation. Um, hello everyone, I'm Stacy Hammer and I work for the uh, Lower Sioux Indian community. Um, also an enrolled tribal citizen of the Lower Sioux community. Um, we are one of four Dakota communities um, in Minnesota. The other seven are Anishinaabe or Ojibwe, um, just to give you a little history of the land that you're standing on currently. Um, I would say, you know, when, when I think of food and I think of our tribal communities across the board, whether you're talking Native Hawaiian, Native Alaskan, um, or you know, Dakota. You know, food is something that um, it's it's almost a, unfortunately trauma has has attached itself to a lot of a lot of our our food systems here um, in and across the nation. Like, as I mentioned, I think um, we are seeing a more of a revitalization of getting back to our indigenous foods. Um, I'm sure you guys have heard of Sean Sherman, um, the sous chef and really reclaiming our traditional foods. Um, and so when we started doing this work in our community um, and our recent um, food pantry opening, um, that was a lot, there was a lot of conversation you know, with our community, with our elders, because you know, when we talk about traditional foods, it's not something that my parents even grew up with. Um, it, it was commodity food, so it was black and white government labeled um, foods that were brought. Um, white flour, all of these different things. And so when we, we talk about traditional food, it's, we have to tread lightly, and especially when talking to our elders, because you know, they utilize the foods that were given to them um, to sustain our families. Um, so at this point, we're trying to have a resurgence and teaching our youth what indigenous foods were and why they're important to, to bring back to our communities. Um, so when we talk about tribal food sovereignty and things like that, it can mean so many different things, I think, in tribal communities. It can mean opening up our own our organic gardens within our community, um, bringing back some of those um, foraging um, practices that we've, we've kind of lost over the years and hunting practices and, th and things like that. But also recognizing that some of these foods um, 
you know, are something that we're very connected to as well. So, you know, fry bread is something that I think a lot of people think when they think of tribes and, and native people, they think of fry bread, which, you know, it's very debatable, especially in the health world. <laughs> it's not a traditional food, but it, it, it's, it's kind of a traditional food. Um, so it's, it's something that you're, you're going to hear out there that, you know, we, we're always trying to, you know, with our elder nutrition program, um, that's kind of like a special day where we allow <laughs> in the program to have fry bread, but working on ways to make that healthier. Um, but just thinking along the lines of, you know, going beyond words and into action, um, you know, I think there's a lot of buzzwords around health equity and, um, you know, what does that actually mean when you get to the community level? I mean, I'm, you know, seeing it in academia and seeing it published with different organizations, um, but seeing it actually come into, um, into action is, is really, really important. And I think that comes from getting to know the communities that you're trying to support and partner with. Hi. Um, <clears throat> hi, my name is Daisy de Leon Esqueda and I manage the food shelf in, at, uh, in Mankato. Um, I have been a part of many conversations where we have discussed poverty, homelessness, affordable housing, and food insecurity. And they're great conversations, but you know that as soon as you walk out that door, that conversation ends, and that feeling and that power that you had just kind of subsides. Um, the fact that, that we are going ahead and we're, and we're taking action, um, not only are we realizing that there is issues, that there are issues within our community, but we're also addressing it. And for me, it's very important because any issues that exist in our community, as soon as they're tackled, I think it reinforces the community, it strengthens the community, and, and it's for the well-being of everyone that lives there. I'm Alice Notool, the very proud CEO of Second Harvest Heartland. I'm a lifelong Minnesotan, a lifelong Minneapolitan, and in fact, I live just blocks down 38th um, and grew up working at my dad and grandpa's drugstore right around the corner. So really grateful for the partnership we have with Sabathony. And this is really both personal and professional for me, um, that we go beyond words and spring into action. And I feel the, an op enormous opportunity, but also responsibility as a leader of one of the nation's largest food banks right here, one of the nation's largest hunger relief organizations to get this right, to help the conversation keep going, and to think differently about how we do our work. I was listening to public radio this morning, and Bono from U2 is writing a memoir. He doesn't seem that old, but maybe that means I'm old. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> But he said he's at the stage in his life that he's ready to shut up and listen. I think that's a nice mantra for a lot of us, especially white-led organizations that are newer to this work, um, newer to the commitment that we listen a lot. Um, and so you have my word that we'll do that, but I'm ready for this conversation and all the work ahead. Awesome. Daisy, you did, uh, sorry, Delinia, you did us a favor of kicking us, kicking us off. I'm actually going to have you go deeper and tell us a little bit more about uh, yourself and the work that you do, because I think the work that you do is so, so important. Well, um, I have an organization, very small organization, Feeding the Dream, and what I do is um, share food with community. I think it's important that healthy food for community and being able to provide that is is amazing. Um, I started out with uh, working with gardens and with children, and if they grow it, they know it. So it's easier for the children that I have now to eat healthier because they've grown all of this food and they know it and they feel comfortable eating it. They eat healthier than I do, which is strange to think about. Um, but I just feel like I like to share with community. We're not, I'm not providing anything for them. I'm sharing it with them. And it feels like something that's equitable for all of us. We're in this together. It doesn't feel like I am the person marching down the street bringing food. It feels like we're sharing this and we share recipes, we share everything that I get. I get coats and bikes and people bring me things and I just share it with community. And that's the important part, to be there and stand in the gap for what community needs are. 
I feel like you're really, really a big that piece that you named earlier. You you are the person that you are that you want to be for the future generations mm -hmm. that you wish you had for yourself. Absolutely. Yeah. I started parenting at 13 years old and I had no idea how to do it or what to do and I just started searching out for people to help me to teach me and that's what I want to be now because there are younger people out there that just need information. They don't need a ton of money. They just need information to be able to help themselves and that's what I want to provide. That's so powerful. The one thing that I just am so struck with all of your stories as you talk a little bit more about yourself is the complexity of the landscape and the importance of why we do this work, right? A lot of you started referencing like, oh, different community members or different even um, potential partners to do this work. My next question is that story of an unlikely collaborator. Because sometimes we just don't know who's that person around the corner that's going to be that good partner in doing this work. So I'm wondering if each of you could share um, an example of that unlikely collaboration or an unlikely partner that has either challenged or uplifted the way that you approach this work. And anyone can start, we don't have to go in order. <laughs> so. I'll start. Um, so I, I live in Mankato, and well, I don't live in Mankato, I work in Mankato, but one of the things that happened was um, there was a company an hour and a half away that needed to hire additional workers. And what they did was they brought about 150 or 200 um, workers and they needed a place for them to live. And the only place available was in North Mankato, which is an hour and a half from this place. So we had um, people from, from Mexico, from the Philippines, from Canada, that were staying and, and are still staying in this hotel. Um, and you can, I don't know if you can imagine what it's like to live in a hotel for over a year with very basic commodities. They have a hotel fridge, and they have a microwave, and very limited space for cooking. Um, and somehow they found out there was a food shelf in Mankato, and they, they would arrive in six and eight, 10 at a time, and it was difficult for us to be able to serve them adequately. I was the only Spanish speaker at that time, and just, I, I had, my, my, my job was not necessarily to, necessarily to take phone calls, but to do other things, and, and I would have to stop doing what I was doing and making sure that they were getting their food, they were getting the resources, and um, after a while, we, we called different organizations and we said, hey, you have transportation, can you bus them to Echo? And all of them said, no, we can't. They don't fall under what our service is, or no, we don't have that capacity. So I didn't know what to do, and I called them in Cato Transit System, and I said, this is my issue, and I know that you're not sending any buses into North Mankato, but we need to get them food. What can you do to help us? And they said, you know what? We can send you a bus. We'll pick them up, we'll drop them off at the food shelf, and then we'll take them back to their um, hotel. And for almost, I would say about eight months, we have been working with the Mankato Transit System. I call them up and I say, I have 50, I have 60, I have, 88 today, what time can you pick them up? And so they go, they pick them up, they take them to the food shelf, we do our 40 to 80 uh, person distribute, you know, food distribution at that time, it takes about, about half an hour to 45 minutes, and then they bust them back to their hotel. I never thought that the Mankato Transit System would step up and would say, yes, we can do this. Um, when school started, because we're a college town, I, I was like, oh no, what are we gonna do now? And, and they said, no, everything's gonna keep working the way it is. They said, Friday works for us, so we're having another distribution tomorrow where the Mankato Transit System will be picking up um, our clients at the hotel, taking them to the food shelf and dropping them back off. That's so powerful. Yeah, incredible. <laughs> yeah. As a people, those of you who work um, in this, like, you know, hunger relief world, we know transportation is a sticky issue, so that is very encouraging. Yeah. Now, let's hear from another one. 
I can go. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Um, I guess an organization came to mind immediately um, when I read through the question and clarified um, with Sook Jin. Um, but I'll just kind of bring us back to give you a little bit of an idea of where, how we are, where we're at today. So it was um, January of 2020, so right before the pandemic, uh, I was sitting in our clinic uh, meeting with Minnesota Department of Human Services and we were discussing um, the results of our food sovereignty survey that we had done in our community. We had just um, done a uh, comprehensive community health assessment and really were analyzing and looking at the food insecurity in our community. It was really eye-opening. Um, I think because I, we just weren't addressed. I guess we weren't really thinking about it until we started talking to the community and really asking these questions um, and asking, you know, are you going hungry? If you are going hungry, are you a SNAP recipient? Um, do you work with WIC? You know, what are what are we what are we seeing? And so it, the results were really, like I said, they were really shocking to me and, and really frightening. So um, started talking with the um, Department of Human Services on the possibility of. Um, how do we get SNAP here? How do we, we don't even have a food shelf. Like how does, how does this even look? And so in those conversations, um, we started talking about the idea of partnering. Um, I was, the first time I had heard TFAP was brought up and what that would look like in our community. You know, we didn't have the capacity, the building. What would we do? Would it be mobile units that would come out once a month? So we were having those conversations and then March hit <laughs> in, in 2020 and, um, our casino, we, our tribe has a, a casino, um, which is how we're able to sustain um, financially our, our, our tribe, a lot of our, um, we were really rely on our business, um, our economic development within our business there. And so when tribes decided to shut down casinos due to the pandemic, um, it really had a huge impact. Um, so we were closed down for about two months um, and laid off, obviously, all the workers. Um, and it was really challenging. And so food became, again, even even more uh, more of a need, and so um, at the time, our uh, Bishop Whipple Mission is the name of the Episcopal Church that sits on our reservation, um, and so they were able to partner with Second um, Harvest um, at the time because they were a nonprofit, and so we started doing mass food distributions in the casino parking lot. Um, but we were finding that it was really challenging, especially for our elders. I mean, we were bringing them boxes of food, but then they felt bad because they said, "Well, it's too much food." or I, you know, it's not food I can eat. So then they were leaving their homes and going over to other homes, like the exact opposite of what we wanted to see them doing. Um, so we started to really have real conversations about, okay, we really, we, we need to figure out a way to have more of a sustainable food shelf and what better time than right now. Um, so we started talking with our tribal leadership, um, tribal councils within um, tribal communities, our, our leadership, um, that's who we consult with, kind of like a board, um, on you know what what we can do. And so we started talking about again the need for um, food the the issue of food security in our community. Um, we were, like I said, in the midst of you know addressing that. Um, but I'm sure you guys are aware of some of the um, funding that came from the federal government, like the CARES Act funding. Um, so tribes were allowed to allocate how they wanted to um, utilize that funding. And so we were able to discuss and dis and distribute some of that. Um, allocate some of that funding towards a food shelf. Um, so we were able to throw up a quick Morton building. <laughs> and in the process of all of that, um, the Minnesota Department of Human Services introduced us to the Foundation for Essential Needs. Um, and so that was the first time I had heard of FEN. And um, because again, I'm sitting here and I'm half of my, half my staff are now um, laid off. So, and, and plus I, I work part-time in the clinic and then also I was the community health um, um, officer at the time as well. So. A lot of my time was figuring out vaccinations, um, you know, talking about testing protocol, and then in the other realm of my mind, I'm thinking about food security. And so when we started talking about what, how do we even start this, um, we uh, were, thankfully, uh, I met Kate Burkraft at um, FEN, and immediately I just felt this amazing um, feeling of, I just let out a huge sigh of relief, like, oh my God, there's someone to help us because I have no idea what I'm doing. I've never done this before. Like, you know, it's, it's, it was really, really a frightening time, um, just in general. And so having those conversations, um, you know, they immediately, they even came out. I mean, in the middle of the pandemic, we were masked up. We were <laughs> in our casino. Um, and I'll backtrack really quick. So in the casino, we have a Dakota Expo Center is what it's called. It's an entertainment center. Well, of course, that was shut down. Um, even when we opened the casino back up, that area shut down because we weren't doing any indoor entertainment. So 
we had talked with our clinic, our, excuse me, our uh, casino CEO and said, can we put up a makeshift food pantry in here until we can get into our building? And so we, we, they agreed to allow us to do that. So in that time period, we learned the process of how to order food from um, Second Harvest. Um, Kate and some of her colleagues came out. We started talking about mapping out like a design of what the food pantry will look like when we, get, when we get into that space. So we were able to do a lot of that pre-work before we opened it up. I mean, as things as, as, as small as like ordering carts and things like that. Um, and then of course staffing, like what do, you, what do you do when you've never had something like this? And now you have this huge operation because our plan was to of course feed everyone. So our entire community as well as our employees. Um, and of course, once we became two TFAT members, obviously we're, we're including everyone. Um, so, you know, at that point, um, when we opened up the doors, I, we just felt so like, wow, this is, this is actually happening. And, and thankful for, so thankful for Fen for that because Again, um, now when I'm in that space, we're open every Wednesday. Um, the first words that came out of a lot of the mouths of the people that came in for the first day, opening day, was, I feel like I'm in a grocery store, you know, which was wonderful to us because you don't want that feeling of um, the stigma that I think is attached to a lot of uh, the idea of like needing food. Um, and so, you know, it, it is a choice model. It, it just feels um, it's a friendly environment. Um, and again, I think working with Fen, and we still work with them. I mean, they work with us and help us with like our analytics because we've been open officially for one year. We opened September 29th of uh, 2021. So it's been a year and we're still learning and we're still learning from Fen. Um, we've had a changeover of staff. So our community health representative um, is who actually is running the food pantry. Amongst other things, we all wear a lot of hats. Um, but uh, we had a changeover in staff, and now with our new CHR, she's been in the role for, I think, three months now. And again, Fen was right there to kind of guide her and help her um, with some trainings and get her, get her kind of um, up to date on, you know, the process and ways to um, kind of improve uh, the food pantry. So long story short, um, we're very, very, it was just a surprise, you know, and again, I, I still think of sitting down at that table and hearing, you know, about Fen for the first time and how we still have that relationship and it's continuing, so. That is so powerful and congratulations yeah. for reaching that one year mark. I mean, to think that you were responding to community needs in that time of crisis, but it's also still so thoughtfully built out and so lovingly created. Like, I think that there's, there's power in that. So yeah, congrats for that one year. Yeah, let's hear from another person, another story. I'm happy to share and just to jump off this idea of acknowledging when you've never done something before <laughs> and what that raises, right, in terms of the opportunity for innovation and problem solving and collaboration, but also just the fear and challenge and looking for uh, support from others so that we also don't feel that sense of isolation that could hold us back. Um, and so as a health system, uh, certainly there's a lot of expertise that our clinical providers and our operational uh, leaders and our uh, nursing and other caregiving staff have um, very often look to for the solution, right? And so this is a new area for us that we certainly approach with a lot of humility because as we've started to understand more increasingly about the social determinants of health and the ways in which 90% of health is largely influenced by things that happen outside of our hospital and clinic walls. As we see the data that shows us how, you know, a three mile distance between the zip codes that you live in can result in, you know, the difference of a 13 year life expectancy and understanding those systemic challenges. We have just recognized uh, that there are limits to our knowledge and what we can do alone. And in 2015, when I first joined the healthcare system, um, really appreciated that uh, as we were at that time Health East and the East Metro, there was a focus on learning to do things differently and bringing in different capacity. And that really meant learning to work with community um, for their guidance and wisdom and partnership in new ways. And so uh, when I was able to come on board, we had support from the CEO and the board at that time, uh, dollars allocated from the hospital foundation, the health system foundation, and the commitment to try to do something differently. There had been certainly data from our community health needs assessment and other partners to understand the opportunity to really focus in on some zip codes on the east side of St. Paul in particular, and that was vetted also through community conversations and reaching out and seeing the strength and the assets that existed in that community from the neighborhood groups, the faith organizations, um, and the community leaders that were really committed to that geography. And so 
again, with a lot of humility and recognition that um, there was longstanding history, uh, including of our health system, right, of divestment from large institutions and understandable mistrust with health care, um, that there was still an openness to exploring that conversation. And so that resulted in us, you know, initially just having monthly convenings with different uh, community organizations, cultural groups, to be able to say together what more could we do together than we could do separately, and to step away from the sort of day-to-day -day needs and think a little bit more broadly. And over the course of six months, that group built some relationships, started to recruit more people in who had a connection to the east side and to this broader question of health and well-being and health equity. Um, and from there, focused in on wanting to think about food and then mental health and stress resilience as a couple of key topics. And so from our perspective, over the next eight months then, we as a health system seeking to be an anchor institution were able to provide funding so that the organizations who then were able to send staff to these every other week, half day, co-design sessions, opportunities certainly for everyone to get to know each other, for us to break bread together, investing in local BIPOC uh, caterers so that we could also enjoy um, the diverse food assets on the east side. Um, but really walked through a process together that was facilitated by an external facilitator from the area that we um, supported so that we could, as the health system, be one important player at the table, but only one important player at the table um, and be positioned to learn uh, very much from our community partners. And so the, through the course of those eight months, uh, we did with the Mental Health and Stress Resilience Group really gratefully um, have cultural brokers, uh, ultimately five and now six, uh, full-time bilingual bicultural staff uh, hired by uh, Fairview now, um, but embedded within community partners like the American Indian Family Center, <laughs> Clues for our Latinx uh, Hispanic uh, cultural broker. Uh, we've had a couple for our African American cultural broker from Wilder Foundation's Kofi Services to now Family Values for Life on the east side and the current organization of Minnesota and the Hmong American Partnership. Um, and so that's been a, a great way to support some of the food efforts as well as we think about moving upstream and supporting folks to address some of the challenges that are preventing you know, security and stability um, and, and a variety of other health and well-being challenges. Um, but our food focus group, uh, drawing from the Minnesota Food Charter, was able to focus on food skills and how at that time working with a, a local uh, provider and purchaser focused on procuring locally um, in an inclusive way was able to devise these make-at-home meal kits, uh, which are growing, of course, in popularity, uh, but provided 100 families on the east side with a 10 kit, a 10 week, and then an eight week following that meal kit program, um, and engaging community in cooking demonstrations, partnering with local grocers, and having the different opportunities for developing food skills, also with emphases on youth and seniors, and thinking about how we shape a meal program that uh, really elevated the ways that they connected with one another. And that has resulted now, years and years on down the line, in uh, even greater partnerships with the Metro Food Justice Network, and I know a number of other partners in this room here, um, with these community cooks meal boxes uh, that you know provide an opportunity for youth employment and that really center, again, the uh, importance of dignity in the meal boxes, the reflection of these diverse cultures, so that that food feeds not just you know the stomach, but also the soul and the community. Um, and then really focuses on investing in our local food ecosystem, knowing that purchasing at market rate is going to result in uh, growers having access to this market, and that that, for all of us, then means greater wealth as well as greater health for our communities. And so just a few different thoughts on how we were able to show up differently ourselves in convening and trying to provide resources and showing up with humility, and that that has meant all the world to us because we wouldn't have come up with those solutions on our own and wouldn't have been able to sustain them. But through that process of building relationships, co-design and co-implementation, it's grown into something much bigger than we could have been a part of previously. I so appreciate you sharing that example and really starting with that piece around humility because I feel like that openness to listen, to partner, to co-design has just led to such beautiful and thoughtful um, innovations from that. Like it really reminds me of that saying, like nothing for us without us. And you brought the folks to the table, you work with the folks at the table. So that was really beautifully done. Yeah. Okay, so um, 
I guess <clears throat> working with community has been the biggest surprise for me. Um, the pandemic started and the I live in the Frogtown Rondo area. Our food shelf closed down in 2016, so there was no food shelf in community. Um, but then the pandemic started and people just started bringing stuff to my house because the local grocery stores were closed. They just started bringing stuff to my house and putting it on my porch and saying, you know where to put this, you know where, you know where the need is, you know how to get it out to people. And reluctantly, I was like, okay, I'm doing other stuff, but okay, you guys insist, I'm doing it. And that's why I started my um, organization, Feeding the Dream. And to me, the dream is that nobody is hungry, not just no child is hungry, but no parent is hungry also. Um, I think supporting the parents, and I am a parent, I am a parent, I'm a second generation mother, and which means I'm raising my grandchildren. And it's just as hard the second time as it was the first time. Um, things are more expensive now. So being in community and working with people that I live with, that I live next to, that can come to me and feel comfortable saying, you know, I don't have this, or do you know where I can, get this resource from, it's important. And I think that was the most surprising thing, that people were feeling comfortable enough to come to me or to come to my distributions. And I know their name, I know their face, I know their children, their kids play with my kids. And just to build that relationship, that was the important thing to me because, I mean, we are a community and that's what keeps us safe. I just think of the amount of trust and love that people could feel from for you know from you knowing that like you are the person that they turn to right it's like oh yeah Galena's got us covered she know where the food's gonna go and that that you do I mean it speaks so much about how there are all of these informal channels that really you know prop up and pull up the communities that we're in and like that you are so yeah that, that's amazing thank you for that absolutely yeah. Good. it's um so interesting to hear all these stories because a lot of us and a lot of the organizations that are present today have been around well before the pandemic but um the concentration of like innovation and creativity that has been uh spurred over the last few years is um you know inspiring still I know it was hard, but it's inspiring. So when I think about um, our mission at Second Harvest Heartland is to end hunger together. So partnerships are central to what we do every single day. Um, and, you know, we partner, we have the good fortune of partnering with so many in this room, including Sabathony. We stock their food shelves. We also gather for conversations um, so we can learn what frontline hunger fighters need from us that's different. Um, so it's a lot of listening, I've heard that, a lot of entering with humility, trying to open your mind to doing things in new ways. A couple of other things that we've, we've learned, so not necessarily unexpected partners, but unexpected needs. Um, for instance, we have a wonderful partner, uh, partnership with Shiloh Cares Food Shelf in North Minneapolis. And we learned during the pandemic, they um, needed different help from us. Food, great, but they couldn't keep their food shelf staffed. They were paying their volunteers to make their food shelf work. Um, and so they needed help paying them. They're in a, um, you know, a lot of communities don't have the luxury of time, transportation, or wealth to volunteer time. And so we gave a grant to help pay for the workers who kept that food shelf open, which has been a lifeline to that community. We never had done that before. Um, and thankfully, <clears throat> the leader there, Jalila, uh, uh, called us up and, and was really communicative with us, and we listened, and that's the key. It's being humble, we don't know all the answers, and it's about listening. Um, one of our other partners, ICA Food Shelf and Hopkins, 
they are um, evolving their work to be a one-stop support for youth. It is youth-informed, and it was an eye-opener to us that we, um, you know, we not only provide food there, but we open our minds to having conversations about the other issues youth are facing, um, including, um, you know, not only food access but job readiness, um, housing, etc. So. Just showing up at a table to ha and being game for that broader that broader conversation, um, but it's been you know there's another organization, Sane Foundation, has been new to us in the last few years. Um, they didn't do food before the pandemic, and now they do, and they're <laughs> rocking it. Um, and so, just I think the key for me, from my perspective, is you know the whole world fell apart and turned upside down in the last three years. So in my mind, I am forever an optimist, but let's use that disruption to think differently and to get to some of these solutions. A lot of solutions we know that are, that are tried and true, there's so many we don't know. And so it's about exploring with um, uh, partners, sometimes new partners, sometimes new ways to partner, um, but keeping your minds and your ears open to that. We're, we're trying to do that as a team and as an organization in a different way than we have. I love that reminder that you included in your story around how even though we are the same partners, but yeah. if we make the assumption that like, oh, we know everything about this partnership, then we're never open to genuinely listening to each other and how important it is. It, that as well, in addition to new partners that we can get. So thank you for that. I am just so inspired by the stories. I don't know about you all, but I know I am. <laughs> Um, and I just can't help but to think about how this work is hard work, right? I think in your stories, that is evident. You know, the kind of conversations that you have to have, the, you know, <laughs> reaching out that you gotta do. And as we all know, um, racial injustice is just so pervasive in the world that we live in right now. So as you do this work, as you are partnering with, you know, unlikely partners or new partners, existing partners, like, how do you keep encouraging folks to lean in to do this work? It's easy for folks to check out and to feel like, I just can't, it's too exhausting, or it's not my lane, I should just let other folks do it, right? But all of us need to do this work. So how do you encourage, or what, what can we do to encourage each other to keep leaning into this difficult work? I think for me, um, it's convincing myself to lean in to do this work because most of what I do right now is free. Like, I don't get paid, I don't have a salary, I do this simply because my community needs it. And sometimes a lot of the things come out of mine and a couple of my um, board members' pockets. And um, that's the hard part being so small and not having grants and things like that to support me, convincing myself that leaning in is the right thing to do and standing in the gap is what we need to do. I'm not a church, I don't have like, I'm just a community member in this trying to help and be there for community and absolutely convincing myself to say, okay, we still need to do this, let's hustle up and find money. That is definitely the hardest part for me. Yeah. yeah. And hopefully that galvanizes more folks to join you. Absolutely, <laughs> um, you know, just give to, co Give to small community organizations that work in community. I mean, it's important because these are the people that are on the ground supporting community and it is the hardest thing ever. I mean, I don't wanna have sleepless nights because I'm trying to figure out how to get food from our community. It should be readily available and I shouldn't have to have a million dollar grant, it should be, okay, Delinia, you know what community needs, let me help you and here's how we can do that. Okay. Yeah. Thoughts from the others? I mean, I can go, if you want me to. Um, I think working at, when we're talking about regional or systems levels, 
it, change can be daunting. I think it's sometimes, it takes a long time to see change at that scale. So what I, um, so it takes a lot of endurance. And, um, you know, I just encourage everyone to settle in and commit over the long haul for this because it's not going to happen overnight. Um, I've also learned, I think particularly in the last few years, that um, perfectionism is the villain of progress. And so I, a number of you have probably heard me say that um, I am the queen of the pilot. And let's try it. Let's see if it works. You, you try it. You figure it out. You listen. You, um, and then you fail fast and move on if you have to, but at least you've learned. The key about that is... Um, so the experimentation is to share what you know so you can help prevent other people from going down the same path or you help everyone learn together. So I think, um, you know, um, you know, just some of the things I've learned. The other thing I think, you know, I have a responsibility as a white leader, a white-led organization to um, encourage others to lean in um, and to commit. And be visible about their commitments um, and keep taking action. And that's, that's why we're here. And I'll give one final plug, be unafraid to be bold. There is no better time there is than now to be bold. The only way we're gonna make progress is if we're thinking big. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. So you can I, count on us for that. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Others. I can um, maybe build on or respond to what Allison was just sharing too. I think about thinking big because we have a very large health system, 10 hospitals that span the state, um, you know, 50 plus clinics and numerous other sites in terms of specialty care. And so there is that thinking big in order to understand how at scale to address uh, the issues of equity, issues of food, security, and access for our patients, for our employees, and for our community. And yet also to think <coughs> small and specific, right? And so um, in response to the murder of George Floyd down the street here, um, and the civil uprisings that followed. Um, our health system formed uh, sort of an oversight committee, the Hope Commission, and so I serve on that with uh, uh, two others who are clinicians. And it's a way for our joint clinical enterprise to really understand across the scope of that partnership the ways in which issues of equity, of injustice, of racism are per pervasive in you know, education within um, our policies, our practices, um, that there's implicit bias that needs to be looked at and that there is a lot of work to be done in so many different areas. And I think that endeavor of pulling apart, you know, some of these differences between diversity and equity inclusion work where we're thinking about training and culture and how we create belonging, um, are in, related to, but distinct also still, from the healthcare equity we do, right? So within our hospital and clinic walls, um, how is it that patients are seeing employees and caregivers that reflect them and that understand and can accommodate uh, their identities, their approaches to healing and, and work with and honor that? Um, in addition to seeing that there, you know, wouldn't be variances um, uh, by race and by ethnicity or language or gender, et cetera, um, in the outcomes and experiences of our patients. And then, of course, in community, where we're thinking very broadly about health equity and population health in its largest form, that if we don't take care to understand the differences between what produces those outcomes and experiences, we can paint with a very broad brushstroke and not uh, be able to make the critical changes in the nuanced ways for the diversity of the populations um, that we serve and who are stakeholders to this work. Um, and so it is really about thinking big, but not letting that obstruct us from knowing that how it feels and what it means to an individual is ultimately the test of whether that, you know, was actually accomplished. And so I would just, you know, appreciate Allison's point and think about some of the ways in which we want to engineer that differently. And then to continue to think about how we, um, 
change our approaches and have those opportunities um, in partnership to try new things. And so we did uh, this past year close our uh, St. Joseph's Hospital campus um, and transformed it into now the Fairview Community Health and Wellness Hub. And that certainly did not come without a lot mm -hmm. of thought and challenge as we thought about um, what was needed to replace a hospital, a hospital um, that was not able to serve the community and that was not able to sustain itself. Um, and that was calling for us to respond differently to address in a more preventative way the resources that people needed to be healthy and well. So we're excited about this co-located you know, point of access to care and resources that provides mental health and addiction care, um, that will soon have uh, adult day services and then a um, uh, skilled nursing facility, um, and then has Minnesota Community Care, the state's largest a uh, federally qualified health center to provide primary care services uh, in linguistically appropriate and accessible, affordable uh, ways, all in this same building. And right across the street is where we partner with the Sané Foundation with Second Harvest on food distribution for those community cooks meal boxes and for our Veggie RX programs, prescriptions uh, for uh, patients at about 14 of our clinics across the state purchasing from the Hmong American Farmers Association, Sin Fronteras, and um, the Women's Environmental Institute. And so excited about that new approach, but also know it, we just launched in August and there's so much yet to be done and built together in partnership with those community organizations. And then again, that community outreach and engagement process to make sure that it continues to develop and grow uh, with the insights and the assets um, that our community partners and community members can bring to it. I love that, just like being involved, but also paying attention to the unique, the individual, the specific as well. It's great. Yeah. Stacy and Daisy, what else might you both add? You go first. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, I guess in listening to the conversation, um, the leaning in and listening, I think. Um, you know, I've had that question a lot of how do we work, how can we work more um, respectfully um, or effectively with tribal communities? Um, we get that a lot. Um, and I think for me, in the 10 years that I've been doing this work um, in our tribal community, we've built a lot of partnerships over the years. And I think what's been the most successful is when our partners um, are willing to actually visit us and get to know us as a community. Um, I realize we're two hours from the metro, but you know, people, they have cars and ways of getting out to the community. Um, so, you know, I, I've thought of one foundation in particular. Um, we had a grant and they never once in two years visited us. And, um, you know, we'd ask, I think we'd have a phone call with them once a year. Um, the data that they wanted was numbers, it was very quantitative. They didn't want to hear stories because that didn't really fit into their. Um, their mold of you know where the funding was going and why it was what it was doing, um, it was very outcome based. Um, it was it was very hands off, and so having an experience like that, and the experiences I've had since that, um, I've really found that more and more organizations are more willing to actually come and visit us. Um, when you come into our community, um, we welcome you. We um, I really like to work on um, educating on the history of our tribal community because I think that's really, really important for people to understand that, um, you know, we're not in this place of being at the top of the chart and all the health disparities um, because we chose to be in this position. Um, it's not something that we're sitting by and we're just allowing to continue to happen. Um, there's a lot of history as to why this happened. So I think that's why it's important to come, listen, um, learn. Um, and it's not a blame game. I think some people get very nervous and um, worried when we start to talk about history. They don't want to hear the history. They don't want to hear about redlining. They don't want to hear about, you know, when the state of Minnesota was, um, in the, after the 1862 war, that they had no Dakota people were allowed to live in the state anymore. Um, so they don't like to hear that because it's, it's hurtful and they think that we're, we're placing blame and it's not a matter of placing blame. It's a matter of understanding the history so you can see where where this led to, um, the health disparities that we're in right it currently. Um, and trying to focus on, on um, you know, kind of changing that narrative. Um, and understanding, too, that, um, you know, we're not necessarily a project. We're, 
we're a community, we're people, and we do really love to work with with other um, organizations and other partners. Um, you know, like I said, I in thinking of one of our um, partners now, like I mentioned, the Fen Group. Um, you know, it was an immediate um, relationship. I feel like with them. Um, and I feel like it's a sense of family, too, because a lot of our partners, um, when they come and visit us and when we get to know them better, um, they just start to feel like family. And there's not going to be like an end. You know, like five years from now, I don't think we're going to ever stop talking to, you know, some of these organizations such as FEN. I think we're going to continue that relationship. And it doesn't end because a grant ends or it doesn't end because a program may have um, evolved into something different. It's something that will continue. Um, so I think in leaning in and listening, um, I think that's something that um, we found. And we learn. I mean, I, mean, I absolutely love learning. Um, and so when other organizations come in, or if I go to other conferences where I'm with other tribal communities, you know, obviously one size does not always fit all, but you can usually tip take little bits and um, tools from, from each of these gatherings and each of these opportunities to meet people from you know, other areas um, because a lot of us have very, a lot of similarities. And I think people that are in this work, we're in this work for a reason. You know, it's, it's the heart and soul of, of, of who we are as people. So um, whether you know, you're from you know, the metro or you're from a rural area, I think we all have that common bond to want to help each other. So. I love that, that reminder of that. The reason why we choose to do this work was well, so some of the things that you brought up around like come listen learn we're not a project we're a community i think those are just such powerful things for all of us to remember so thank you for that stacy easy round us up <laughs> um so as i'm listening to all the other panelists talk i i have to keep reminding myself that we're all dealing with food and our programs are so different but that is because our communities are so different and our community needs are so different and they are um, they are responding to that need. When I look at my community, um, Mankato is predominantly white, I would say about 93, 96%. But when I look at our numbers and the people that we serve, about 50 of them are BIPOC. And that is, um, that is you know, that's interesting, and at the same time, it's frightening because um, it's it's the reminder, it's reflective of how the BIPOC community is in the most need, right? Um, in the past 20 years, what we have seen in southern Minnesota is how it has become <coughs> more diverse, and um, with that, and and with me working at the food shelf, I have to realize that as the diversity is changing, as it's increasing, we have to make changes to our food shelf. Um, you just can't <coughs> provide food to make a hot dish, right? Now you have to provide food to make other meals, uh, <laughs> such as some bootsas or um, j just whatever it is. But I, I think what we have to do as, as partners is we have to look at what our community looks like, what our cons constituents look like. And then we have to say, okay, this is what our needs are, this is how it's changing, this is how we need to approach it. And um, just pointing something out that you had said, I make changes all the time at the food shelf, and I know that there's volunteers who, who are like, why? <laughs> but if we don't make that change, we're not going to know if it's going to work, right? Yeah. Um, and, um, and a lot of the times I say, yeah, it works. And I'm always open to, to, what, to what they have to say and, and their opinions and their advice because I might be seeing it you know, just from my eyes, but they have a completely different outlook on it. We, we have to be, I, I guess for me, we have to be open to it. And, and that is one of the toughest things that we can do, especially when we're facing adversity when we're um, diversity and, and and it's tough but we have to be open-minded because this is what our community this is what our state is starting to look like and it's it's com it's going to be completely different than what we grew up in um, and it's probably going to be completely different than what we are living in right now I love that it's like <laughs> being able to see the changes that are coming and working with that and also really making the changes that matter to the communities that we serve right and to your point like i love what i love about this panel is that 
you all are serving communities in so many different ways. And I'm so glad for that because, you know, the world is huge. We need everyone as a part of this. And that is so, so key. Um, I realized that, you know, in the conversations that we've had, it's been very much about the work that you all do, your organizations, like the communities that you're in. I'm, I want this question to be about you personally. Like, how do you stay grounded in this work? Like, this is hard work. So how do you stay grounded in this fight personally and stay committed to it? <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'll answer that. Thank you. Um, <laughs> I guess I stay grounded in it because it's, it's like a part of me. It's still a part of my life. I still have needs that go unmet because of financial situations. So I'm still in it. I'm a part of it and I'm in it. So I know that I need to be there for my community. Like I said, it keeps us safe. It, it, addresses traumas in our community. And I mean, the best thing that I could say for me, it, it just, it's a part of me. It's a part of who I am. So that's what keeps me grounded. Knowing that when I'm feeding people, I also am able to feed my children and my second generation children because it's important for us to have I mean, most of the things I do right now is holiday meals. <clears throat> Every month, I try to make it so you can have a holiday meal with your family, something to celebrate. And um, I know, what are we celebrating, right? Poverty? No, we're celebrating that we're able to come together and eat as a family and be in community and have someone standing in the gap to make sure that's possible. So that's what keeps me grounded in my work that I'm doing now. I love that. That's really life-giving. I would echo that. I think, you know, working for a large institution, there is, you know, a disproportionate amount of power and influence that that institution has. And yet, as I show up as myself, right, someone who identifies as a woman of color, the daughter of refugees, um, that that reminds me that I was also not the person that this system was designed for, right? That this, the struggles that I have and others who have other, um, belong to different groups that these systems were not designed for, um, have to be some of that target market for what the system needs to adapt to in order to actually deliver on our mission of, you know, effective patient care, compassionate care for every person in our community. And so, you know, I think about uh, my, my mom and, and what it means, you know, to have grown up with cultural foods, with the ability to, you know, share some of that with my own children now and to think about belonging to not just myself in this time and place, but those who came before me and those who will come after me. And I reflect on, you know, just the experience of, of food as it's been in my life and how my family experience has taught me, you know, the way in which we greet each other in our language is, did you eat yet, right? My paternal great-grandmother, as I understand it, passed away um, due to famine from war. Um, so as we think about the science of epigenetics, right, there are pieces that are, you know, in my blood and my bones that recognize that um, we all deserve food, we all deserve nourishment, but there are times at which human-induced and natural that we aren't going to get that. And so to remember to value it and all the, the ways in which it does benefit us and our lineages and our communities. Um, so did you eat yet? Um, it, when I think about if you have someone over, it isn't a, oh, would you like something to eat, right? Sort of placing the burden upon someone to say, yes, I would. Now, you know, please ask. Um, but to have it available, right? To offer it, to extend it. And, and how does that create a greater sense of access, right? Then, uh, yes, I'm going to respond to that question that creates just a slight barrier. But just to have it there, to extend it, maybe offer it a couple of times if they're a little shy. <laughs> 
And then that when there are family gatherings or parties, there, you know, it's enough food when everyone can eat at the party and have seconds, but also take some home. And you also provide the takeaway containers at the party too, right? So it's ready to go. And so this idea of not just, you know, nourishing and connecting over food and breaking bread for that day, celebrating being together, celebrating the occasion, but sending someone on their way with something more and thinking about the future and how we pay it forward. And so the fact that I am someone who needs to eat, right, and who has hunger and comes from a line of folks who have not always had that access to food and then the continued learning from others who have different experiences than me daily are part of what keeps me really grounded and knowing that uh, we all have needs and the more we can create systems that serve everybody, uh, that's our obligation and opportunity. That's powerful, thank you for that. Absolutely. Uh, well, this is a really kind of a loaded question. <laughs> I had a lot going on in my head um, with this question. So um, for me personally, um, I think on a professional level, so my background is also as a registered dietitian, um, when I first started working for our tribal community, I worked as dietitian diabetes coordinator. That was my role and has evolved significantly in the last 10 years, obviously. Um, but one thing I learned is going straight from college um, and doing clinicals and doing and going into community. I mean, it was it, it, nothing like what they teach you in school. <laughs> you know, it's just they can't teach what you learn in community. Um, and so I just learned really quickly that when it comes to food, you know, I can sit there and I can show them the my plate. You know, and and, and it, none of that resonates. <laughs> I, I think I tried it. I think I tried it for a month or two, and I'm like, this is never going to work. Um, as much as they say it's going to. Um, so, I mean, I started working on ways to help this resonate with the community. So I incorporated language. You know, our language is very um, near and dear to our hearts and revitalization of the Dakota language. Um, we've had a lot of that in our community in the last few years. My, my kids actually are able to take Dakota language courses in our local high school, which is huge. Um, we have an early head start now where the kiddos are learning um, from birth to five. Um, and so I, I, we've, I've just really found that what, what is going to bring community back to the foods that um, are going to actually nourish us and not just feed us. Um, and so over the years, I've really learned that, you know, again, if I can sit there and I can, I can ask them to, well, the best type of meats is, well, of course, the lean meats. And, well, what's the most expensive meat? So I'm asking people to go out and eat traditional foods. Well, bison. Well, okay, the, we can't find bison around here, as sad as that is. 45-minute drive, and you're going to spend $12 a pound. Like, how, how is that realistic, you know? Um, so for me, over the years, learning how to navigate through that and, and talking to community about where community is at, hearing conversations about if we'd have a gathering, um, um, as a community, of course, there's always a feast. Well, the feast was typically fried chicken, mashed potatoes, corn, and big bread roll, and you know, people are bringing extra insulin to cover that meal. It's like this is not what we're we're supposed to be doing. Like, you know, so uh, we formed a health committee in our community uh, for the first time ever, and again, another great partnership was the American Indian Cancer Foundation that we worked with, and really learned. I really learned on the job what policy systems, environmental changes are and why that's important. And instead of just trying to teach people how to eat, but really integrating changes within our systems, within our tribe. Um, so working on policy development and, and looking at anytime we have any type of gathering, you know, we're following some healthy eating guidelines, you know, and we're talking to the community constantly. We're, we're not necessarily surveying, but a lot of focus groups of just really sitting down and having conversations, especially with our elders. Because like I said, I mean, uh, they were the first generation that really grew up on those commodity foods. And so, you know, in their conversations, you know, they'll kind of joke and say, well, geez, my our grandparents were just so skinny and lean and fit. <laughs> Look at us now, you know, and it's a little joke about it. But at the same time, it's like, how are we going to change that then? So I think for me, um, making some of those types of changes at the systems level in our community um, and really bringing, bringing community voices to the forefront. So we, our elder nutrition program, we just recently um, had a new space for that now. So we didn't used to have a dining center for our, our elders. Um, so that just opened in March and having those conversations. I mean, they still do really like their fry bread and they still really do like, you know, some of the um, comfort foods, which is fine. But just, you know, having those conversations and and, you know, one thing I found with our elders is that they're so concerned about our next generations, you know, what's going to happen to them. So they are more than happy to make sure that their grandchildren are fed well, you know. Um, 
they're like, it's too late for me. This is usually what they say. And I say, no, it's not. <laughs> you know, and they're looking at you. They're looking at you and what you're eating. So we, we're, you're not a short order cook. You're not at home making yourself a meal and them a meal. And, and it's coming together and really gathering as a family. So I think for me, that's what really kind of keeps me grounded is just some of the cha positive changes I've seen in the community in the last 10 years. Um, and having, again, those conversations, you know, with my dad about what it was like when he was growing up and where we're at today. And I think, you know, he feels like he feels like there's actually a more positive future than I think he was raised to believe there was. You know, I think we have a lot more ownership in our own health. That's, that's really cool to hear. Yeah. Daisy, Allison. Um, so um, my family immigrated to the States when I was very young, and I... I don't remember a lot. Um, I think I was, I don't know, six, seven, maybe eight. But my dad went from being a landowner that could provide not always our wants, but our needs for our, our family of 10, um, and even in education, um, to being a migrant worker that was working in fields from like sunrise to sunset. And, and then eventually working in a, in a meat processing plant. Wow, this is dumb. But, um, so, so as I was growing up, you know, we didn't have all of our wants, but we had, we had our needs. We always had food. Um, and I remember growing up in this, like, small community, and all of the kids that I went to school with that were also BIPOC, their parents worked in this meat processing plant, or they worked in, um, um, with, like, chickens, or they were in some type of agricultural job so we knew that you know we were kind of the low-income kids um, we, we never went to a food shelf I, I think my parents maybe used um, is it food for food for all or fair, 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 for, all. fair for all maybe used to like two or three times um, I remember some lady going to our house and taking like a bag of food and I asked my mom what it was, and she was like, oh, it was like a bag of food. I got it for like $10, $15. I was like, oh, okay. Um, so I never knew about a food shelf until I was actually introduced to it, and one of my uh, friends said, hey, we're, we're looking for a Spanish speaker at our food shelf. Would you like to come? And I was like, what's that? Uh, and I went there, and I just, and the reason why I say we never used a food shelf was because when my parents needed, when my dad needed a car park, I was the one going with him to the um, to buy that car part. And I would be like, yeah, I need a, a belt for an F-150 <laughs> 93. And, uh, and when my parents needed to go to the doctor, right? Like, I knew what their medical issues were. Um, I, I knew what they were receiving in the mail because I was sitting there, like, reading and saying, oh, this is, this is what it says. This is how much you owe for electricity today. Um, so I, I was very involved, not because I wanted to, but because I needed to. And, and when I see uh, people coming to ECHO, I see my parents, I see my family, I see my classmates, the community that I grew up in, and I also see the community that I'm now part of, right? And, and I see the community that my kids are growing up in. And, and I go back to community because to me, community is everything, right? And we make our community what it is. If we invest in it, it's gonna be good. If we don't, if we don't care, then um, it's not going to meet our needs. But when I have bad days, and usually at work, and usually those bad days um, have something to do with some racial issue that came up, some racial slur that I heard either directed to me or to someone else, um, I take a deep breath and I just ask myself, is my heart still in here? And I realized that the day that I decide that my heart is not where it should be, that I am not there because I'm not interested if my neighbors have food to eat, right? Then that's going to be the day where I'm going to have to move on. And um, so I asked myself, and, and, and as I, you know, that is what keeps me grounded. I came from a low income household, and um, and I know what it was like, and I'm seeing that. And I wish that we could be somewhere else, right? I, I wish that poverty would not be an issue. I wish that we could address it better.
better and, and we're not there yet. We haven't done that yet. But I, I think we ask that, we, we, I ask myself all the time, is, is my heart there? And if it's not, then as I said, that will be the day where I will have to move on. That's the question that we should ask ourselves. <laughs> yeah. mm -hmm. I'm just so incredibly grateful that we're on this panel together and would you believe it, like time has really flown by. So in the last um, six minutes that we have, um, my last question for you all really is, you know, as we look ahead a year from now, right? Like I'm wondering what you all hope to see, what progress must we make um, so that the racial hunger divide is no longer what holds our communities back. I'll go first. Um, I, I just want to thank Second Harvest for not only having the, the, the conversation, right, about, about hunger um, and not only how it affects diversity, but also for taking that step and, and putting that money aside um, when, when we first started receiving grants, I was like, wow, it's about, it's like for BIPOC. And I was really excited because I, as I said, 50% of our clients are BIPOC. And, and then the grants kept coming and, and I was like, what am I supposed to say? I already told them. So I just kept repeating what it was. And I was always thankful for the money that we were receiving. But I want us to normalize culturally specific foods in food shelves. I don't want us to only have them because uh, they were available today, but I want us to have them because this is what it, it, this is what our clients are eating. Um, we should not be providing something it, it, that they don't want. Uh, we have a lot of our BIPOC community that says, please don't give me the soups. I don't know what to do with them. I don't know how to eat them. I don't like them. And, and I am so thankful that Second Harvest has offered us like maseca and soy sauce, sriracha, um, cactus, and people are so excited to be getting food that they like. And to me, ending food insecurity or reducing that rate, it's not just providing someone a box of groceries and saying, here is your food, you're good to go. It's providing them with food that they're actually going to consume. And, and thank you again for allowing us to be able to do that, to provide our clients with food that they are going to eat and they're going to enjoy. Yeah. Well, you're welcome. And thank you for your help. Thank you. Um, Christian, maybe I'll go next, because I think, Daisy, um, we appreciate that so much. And I, so one of the things I hope is continues a year from now is that we're all connected still, and maybe we can celebrate your birthday again next year. <laughs> Um, but when I think about it, so Daisy was talking about, um, you know, a year ago, we, when confronted with the racial hunger divide that has been around for a long time, but came to the forefront again, Second Harvest Heartland raised and dedicated $14 million to fighting the racial hunger divide. So we're through, that was a year ago. So this is year one, we've invested $5 million in more culturally connected foods, um, thinking differently about our sourcing, uh, thinking differently about how we grant money, um, and listening a lot. And we're not stopping. And so I hope that this is, you know, a, a new uh, chapter that we're entering where we don't have to ask a lot of the questions that I'm sure everyone on this stage in this, in this um, auditorium is asked constantly about why we're doing this. It's because of the fact that communities of color experience at least twice the rates of hunger than their white neighbors, and we have to stop that. And so when I think about the future, and it's not just about next year, we're gonna continue, you know, we've got that money, but we're gonna think even bigger. And I, we are considering adopting a moonshot, a hunger moonshot, um, that is a community moonshot, so it's not just ours, it is ours, um, and to cut food insecurity in half, and the racial hunger divide in half by 2030. And I think there's no better time to think that big. I think when I think about um, a moonshot, it is something that gives us focus and clarity and motivation um, to get it right. 
And um, I just really wonder what you all think about that. Um, you know, I know we're only one year into this this big investment. We want to go even bigger, though. Um, and there's no time like the present in my mind. But we need help. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I appreciate so much. Just first of all, what everyone has shared on this panel. So thank you for the opportunity to listen and learn, and um, just really agree that we need bigger goals and vision and to put that forward to be able to bring together the resources and the partnerships that can have that come to light. We launched this year with the Fairview Community Health and Wellness Hub, the Center for Community Health Equity, because the processes that we have been so grateful to be in partnership with so many different community groups um, really showed us the ways in which, you know, we need to work with and create points of access and to create tables that we can participate in equitably to set these significant goals and bring together resources because not any one of us is, is an expert and to think about all the diversity of our communities that need to be reflected in this work um, requires so many more people at the table. And so for us, you know, as a very large employer with 34,000 employees with like a very significant uh, panel of patients, that it really is critical for us to think about how we would contribute to that moonshot. Um, and thinking even by starting within our own employee and patient base and in our community partnerships about how we're able to increasingly screen in a standard way that as food needs uh, and related to chronic conditions are identified that those resources are brought to bear, that the next week, you know, our VeggieRx program um, can be on their doorstep, but also expands <coughs> across the geographies that we serve. And so certainly as we think about that bigger community that we're a part of, as we think about the communities and stakeholders that we have within our patient, employee, and community base, and then we, when we think about the specific neighborhoods and the different cultural groups that we're working with and learning from and trying to be a supportive partner or anchor to, there's so much work ahead in this coming year and over the next 10 years, but that really starts with us acknowledging that there are ways in which we need to show up differently and to be a resource differently and to continue to recognize the wisdom um, and power of community to solve the issues of our time together. So looking forward to partnering with Second Harvest and all of you and all of you on this work ahead. Anyone else with other closing thoughts? For me, it's um, the racial divide in hunger because um, there are not a lot of people like me addressing the needs. <coughs> there are not a lot of people like me at the table. And for a long time, my thoughts were at the table because other people were taking them to the table, but I was standing behind the table. And so I wasn't there. I was a phantom. And I think it's important that we have our voices as people of color, as an African-American woman who has experienced this, being a part of the conversation, because a lot of people that are addressing the needs are not, have never had the need. And that is, you know, you, you can't, you don't know unless you know. So that is it for me. And I mean, let's just make, food a right and not a privilege. Yes, yes, that is a very powerful statement. Food is a right, not a privilege. Help people. Yeah. Um, yeah, again, a lot of thoughts going through my head. I've had four or five different conversations in my head about where to go with this last question. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, I guess, you know, a lot of things, how do you solve the racial divide? How do you solve systemic racism and poverty, um, you're, yeah, it's, it's a lot. It's a heavy, it's a heavy, heavy topic, and it's something that I think we're finally, people are getting more um, willing to have the conversation, to have these conversations of how do we, how do we solve this problem, and, um, you know, like you just mentioned, I mean, it's bringing the people to the table um, and actually having a place at the table, I think, is really, really important because um, I think for so long, a lot of communities of color um, have been completely invisible. They, we've been talked about. We've, we're always in bar charts, you know, but we're never brought, you know, 
<laughs> we're never like brought to the table to say, what can we do or what can you share with us? How can we be a better partner? How can we help, how can we help support you? Because um, when it comes down to it, community is the one that's going to know what's the best way to support their own community. You know, so um, again, these powerful partnerships that we have, like with Second Harvest Heartland, um, that's that's the future, I think. For and, and knowing that it's sustainable, and knowing again, like I had mentioned earlier, that these relationships continue, and that we continue to work together um, to solve this. You know, I think that's. That's what will be my, my closing thoughts on all of this, is that this isn't going to be a trendy thing that's going to go filter away here in the next few years, and we're all going to be left back where we were. You know, all this progress that we made needs to continue. It can't just, you know, float away when the funding goes away, because that's been a huge fear for us. Um, you know, when, when the funding became more, all of a sudden, you know, there's funding coming out of nowhere, and you got to hurry up, and you got to spend it in a year, and you got to you got to report on all these different things. It's like, well, how is that sustainable? <laughs> you know, so that's where we've really reached out, and that's where we've really partnered with um, what what organizations that have now become like family to us. That we know that they're not going to just leave us behind in ten years. You know, what we're still going to continue those those partnerships. Well, I'm just so immensely grateful that we got to have the depth of conversation that we did, the bold step or with the moonshot, the reminders that food is a right for all, that we need to be at the table, the communities need to be at the table. I think that's just such key ingredients for an equitable future. So everyone join me in giving folks a round of applause.